So yesterday, Joe Biden issued an executive order on sweeping gun control. Now, the irony was probably lost in him that the state of California, where he gave the speech after burning 30,000 pounds of jet fuel to get there, has the most murders of any state in America, yet far and away leads the country in some of the most strict gun regulations and one of the lowest rates of legal gun ownership. But I'm sure that doesn't matter to him at all. This law will include stricter background checks. Now, of course, they don't define exactly what that means because as fellow gun owners, you and I know when we can attest to, the current background checks already include a state and federal check, as well as many states like California, my home state of Connecticut, require you to get a permit before you can even buy or carry a gun. So it gets better, folks. This executive order will extend resources for red flag laws. They more palatably named it extreme risk protection orders. What could possibly go wrong here? Any, anyone who thinks red flag laws are a good idea, they're fools. Red flag laws don't work. Case in point, California, Nevada, Virginia, Florida, Colorado, Illinois, Connecticut, and many more that have seen some of the most horrific mass shootings have these unconstitutional red flag, red flag laws. They did nothing to stop the mass shootings. Even though, even though, and this is the, the craziest part, most of these mass shooters in these states were known to authorities for a variety of either criminality, as some issue, or bizarre behavior, and they did nothing. But beyond being completely useless, they are blatantly unconstitutional. Here's, here's why. Depending on the state, someone close to you can report you as a, quote, concern, a perceived danger to yourself or maybe others, effective immediately, you will have your lawfully owned firearm seized. Keep in mind, you've not committed any crime at this point. No probable cause, just someone close to you reports it and voila, they're gone. You just had the government take away a civil liberty. In many states, the person who reports you may even remain anonymous sometimes. Then, to get your guns back, you have to likely hire a lawyer, pay money, go to court, justify why you without committing a crime, should be able to keep your constitutionally protected right. And if the state finds you suitable to keep your guns, they give them back to you in 30 days, six months, sometimes a year. And then there's no consequences for anyone other than you. Now, this would never be misused, right? An angry neighbor, disgruntled employee, maybe an ex-wife. They would never use this against you, right? But imagine this. A former Navy SEAL, shooting instructor, law-abiding citizen who never had an issue, who was actually even encouraged by that ex-wife to carry a gun after their house was broken into, then suddenly one day she decides to use a provision in these red flag laws and simply insinuate that you're a danger to your child as leverage for control, money, or even custody using your guns as collateral. I don't have to imagine it, because it happened to me. Thankfully, I had the means to fight my guns were never confiscated, but they were ordered to be locked up during the adjudication process, and I could not carry them to defend myself or my child should the need arise. I challenged, and I won handedly, even receiving an apology from the judge for my troubles. The NRA did a fantastic documentary on it. But for six months, I was not permitted to exercise my Second Amendment rights because someone close to me made baseless allegations. Imagine, had I needed to defend myself or my daughter, during those six months. You see the unintended consequences here and why we have to fight so hard for this? The question everyone should be asking is, what laws can you pass to make criminals abide by more laws? The answer is none, zero, nada. Zero criminals, especially those willing to commit murder, are going to say, hmm, I can't have this gun in this gun-free zone. No, in fact, they go look for that gun-free zone and then they target it because they know nobody will be shooting back. Now, according to the Crime Prevention Research Center, only a little more than 1% of mass public shootings since 1950 have occurred in places that were not considered to be gun-free zones. It's 98 and change percent in gun-free zones. Since we're doing journalism in here, want to know where the highest concentration of increases of gun crime are per capita? Hmm, would you look at that? The acute areas of increased gun crime directly correspond with democratically-led districts. Weird! so weird that there's a striking correlation. Could Democrats and their bad policies be the problem? Maybe not the guns? I mean, look, spoons don't make people fat. Cars don't make people drive drunk. But the notion that Democrats are pushing that more guns equals more crime is not factually accurate at all. We've already talked about the ratio in California. 
But let, let's get a little bit more granular here to make my point. Let's take my home state of Connecticut. All right, so anti-gun, deep blue commie Connecticut. The CT Post, not a conservative paper, folks, was so nice to note, quote, the number of gun deaths declined slightly over the last 10 years. Oh, really? Must be because there's less guns, right? I mean, that is what our governor, Ned Lamont, is using to push his new gun control bill, but a simple peruse of the internet shows that, in fact, the opposite is true in Connecticut. More guns equaled less crime. More guns than ever before are being purchased in Connecticut, year after year. The other misleading thing the vegan, double mass Prius driving gun grabbers use is gun death. But it's important to distinguish this. I mean, this is an overgeneralization. Suicides account for 58% of those deaths, and 41% were the result of homicide. The majority of gun deaths are, in fact, suicide, not homicide. Now, I'm not saying this should be ignored, but if the goal is less crime, let's at least use accurate data to legislate for it. Liberals get away with this data distortion all the time. It drives me insane. Republicans get beat down by the talking point that if you don't do something, then you're for gun violence. No one is for gun violence. That is the worst talking point I've ever heard. But we let them win on it. Then Republicans make some sort of compromise. Republicans buckle and do some bipartisan law that gives Democrats more power. Democrats take more of our rights. Republicans say they did something on their next election flyer that you get in the mailbox. Meanwhile, you and I and every other gun owner after this compromise we lose. We never gain anything. I, I, and I know every rhino representative out there comes back to gun owners and says, oh, we stopped it from being much worse. No, you gave us more gun restrictions that are now harder to challenge in court because it was watered down with your spinelessness. Stand up for your oath. And when the same people who are protected by the very guns they don't want you and I to have, the same people who left $80 billion of weapons for the Taliban in Afghanistan can't pass their own pipe dreams legislatively because they know they'll get voted out for it? They do exactly what Joe Biden did yesterday and tried it through executive order, claiming the moral high ground by standing at the location of a shooting that their very policies likely caused in the first place, surrounded by people armed by the very guns they're trying to ban. Joe Biden, Ned Lamont, all these guys like that, and big government liberals. If you really believe in this narrative, how about you give up your armed security? Why not? Is your life more important than mine or yours? My guns, they're not negotiable. Shall not be infringed. Pretty simple. The Second Amendment was the second thing they wrote. Out of all the things they prioritized when they started a country, Guns were the second thing they wanted to make sure everybody could keep. Think about that. Look, if, you, if you're not a gun owner, infringements like this apply to you still just the same. Everyone must oppose government overreach because if they can do it to a constantly, constitutionally protected right, like the Second Amendment, they can do it to anything. And if you sit idly by while they do, you will be less powerful when they come for something you do care about. This includes when they pass a new gun law, that you don't care about, maybe it doesn't even apply to you. It does. They all do. Look, there was a pastor in Nazi Germany who spoke up about the need to stand up to tyranny, even when it doesn't apply to you. He gave a speech at a great deal of venues, so the exact text varied, but most accurately quoted said, first they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out, because I was not a Jew. Then they came for the communist, and I did not speak out, because I was not a communist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. But then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. See how that works? He's right. Gun owners are the most persecuted class of people in America. We have heightened scrutiny on everything, held to a higher standard, and are constantly the target of political persecution. Most gun owners, like you and me, we spend more time making sure we comply with the laws than we do throwing baseballs with our kids because we understand what's at stake. So don't tell me that guns and lawful gun owners are the problem. You, Joe Biden, the author of the gun-free zone legislation, which has killed more innocent people than any other gun law in the history of America, you are the problem, not me. We live in a country with more guns than people, possessed by more than 100 million God-fearing, law-abiding citizens. 
And if, if we and our guns were the problem, believe me, you'd know about it. But we're not. Criminals are. The same criminals that this administration, the Biden administration, will go to great lengths to keep out of jail. Let that sink in.